Well, you know, uh, Wednesday is Veterans Day, so we're getting a jump start on that. And we want to thank all of our uh, ladies and gentlemen who have served in any branch of the military or who may currently be serving. And I know we got one out there probably in the lobby. Uh, so I ask them to come in here too, Mr. Wayne. But if you have or are serving in any of our branches of the military, would you stand for a second? Thank you. Whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't tell you to sit down yet. While, while you're standing, let me pray for you and let me pray for others in your family. Can I do that? Let's pray. God, we, uh, we're grateful for this nation, one nation under God. And we are grateful for uh, the Constitution and the preamble and other documents that basically say we are created equal. And we come to you as, as equals regardless of walk of life or any other designation. And Lord, those who have served and in some cases fought to protect and to preserve our freedom, our liberty, God, we are grateful. We are grateful for your hand in using the men and ladies in this room uh, to continue to make that happen. And those that you are calling out to do the same in the future days. And so, God, would you continue to have your hand on these guys and their families and continue to give them that affirmation and that fulfillment of knowing that um, they have led this nation in a significant way. So we ask it all now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Now you can be seated. Well, good morning. My name is Randy, and if you're watching out there on, on, on your couch or your recliner or your kitchen table or wherever you are, we want to greet you and thank you for being here. You might want to grab a couple of things to write some notes on and grab your Bible or get your app on on your phone, however that works for you as well as in here. I've met a few first-timers here and then in the room with us, first time worshiping here, and we are so grateful to have you and hope to get to know you a little bit better out on the porch area there under the hospitality tent afterwards. You know, um, ninth grade civics, uh, back in my day, the uh, Civics 101 said the, the rules, uh, the reason for governance is basically justice, order, and safety. That's what, that's what the um, system of government is all about, justice, order, and safety. I think the discussion has more turned into, as it always does, I think in every society, is what is legitimate authority and what about the authority that I don't happen to agree with. Because we've seen good examples of all of that all week long, haven't we not? Depending on which side you're on, it's either legit or it's not legit. And then for a lot of people today, but let me remind you, and this might be a good tip for you. I, I went back and read Romans chapter 13 again to refresh my memory because basically that says God puts authority figures in front of us and who he as sovereign, people who are in authority are by God's sovereign grace. And so therefore our job is clear cut, right? We have to, we have to see that authority, whether it's a boss at work, whether it's an overbearing dad and you're still living in your home, uh, we can carry that out to, to any scenario you have, I think. But that, that is our role. So uh, for a lot of people today that might be thinking all is lost and everything, no, all is not lost. Let me remind you, the king's still on the throne, is he not? And he will not be displaced, whether you voted one way are another and just as our veterans have illustrated to us you know when you're in that role it's not about politics it's about liberty now what we've been talking about the last three weeks is actually very countercultural, uh, even in that setting because we're basically saying there's freedom in surrender to Christ now military you don't ever want to surrender that's not the path to freedom 
But here, it's exactly the path to freedom. The quicker I learn to surrender my life to Christ, I get it back much more liberated and redeemed. And that's been our theme today. And so we're going to go ahead and talk about that. So um, everybody look at me and, and do this. All right. At least we have college football. To, well, no, actually. Everybody in this state either didn't play or got whooped yesterday. So we can't go there. At least we have Somerville High football on Friday. No, they got B2, didn't they? <laughs> I'm going to tell you what my grandparent used to tell me. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. And I think I have a little more substance to illustrate it today from the book of Ephesians. So go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. We all, I think you would agree, we all uh, are fallen people who live in a fallen world. And one of the byproducts of fallen people who live in a fallen world is Lamentations 1.14 in the Old Testament. The writer of that says in 1.14, My sins have bound me into a yoke, and the Lord has sapped my strength. See what he's saying? My sinfulness confines me, restricts me, locks me down. The culture is saying, hey, give in to it. Give in to your desires, your passions, your lust, your thoughts, your ideology. Everybody not only is supposed to respect it, they're supposed to not interfere with that. And if they do, they're evil and they need to be dealt with. That's what we're being told time and time and time again. But the gospel basically says, no. The freedom is denial of that. The freedom is resisting every lust and passion and, and, and desire that comes along uh, because in that is the path of freedom to surrender in Christ. Because our strength, we are weak, weak people. Jesus in, in John 8 came along and said, let me just break it out for you. When you are in sin, you are locked up. You're a slave to whatever sin dominates you. You're a slave to whatever sins, uh, sin comes into. And then that's when he follows up and says, because the truth will do what? Truth will set you free. And, I, and then later he says, I, I am the truth, right? So he connects the dots for us very well. So that's our premise today. So let me, let me give my main point to you, and then we'll go right into that. Authority strengthens equality. Authority strengthens equality. Now, Psalm 99.4 is a great, I think, example of that from the NASV. The strength of the king loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. So the true authority executes justice, and that creates equality. Think about it. Every room that Jesus walked into... He automatically tried to leverage the status of everybody in that room to be on equal footing, did he not? From the governor, from Pontius Pilate, right on down to the leper, to the, to the worst uh, beggar in town with no status, or women, or children who had no status, he, he equalizes everybody because of his authority. And that's what a good leader in every setting ought to do. The problem with that is we have something in us, I do, I'm like you, where we want to question. And it started when we were children. How many times if you had a sibling, how many times did you say, who made you the boss of me? Who made you the boss of me? And how many times have we gone and griped with our spouse when we got home? You know what he asked me to do? You know, talking about your boss or somebody. And we, we want to make those things illegitimate. I'm not talking about illegal, immoral, all that stuff. That's, that's obvious. We can't follow. We can't get with that. So let me tell you this. This passage is going to get a little tense, a little controversial. Don't get too sensitive. Because the controversy centers around this. It's a discussion about slaves. He addresses slaves and he, he addresses slave owners. So two questions that follow us around in the modern day especially is, does the Bible condone slavery? The other question is, if it does not condone slavery, why does it not condemn it? 
So that is why I'm going to try hard, and I try hard every week to say, you know, we first need to come to the Scripture from the historical, what was it like to them in the first century? Because that helps us understand the discussion in this century. Because in this century, looking backwards, it's easy to say, oh man, you know, that's just a weakness or a contradiction of the Scripture. Is it condones it or it does not condemn it. No, I disagree with that. I disagree with that. And I'll try to tell you why as we break this out. You ready? I feel like we need to pray again right quick, but I'm gonna, we're going to go ahead. So here's, here's the deal. We're going to look at this from two ways. If you're under authority, and guess what? 100% of this room is under some authority figure, right? And then we're going to look at it if you're over authority. You're in the authority seat here. Because if you're 18 and above, my guess is, again, everybody in this room at some point in time is in that position too. So I think, I think it applies to all of us. So let's, let's jump right in. First, when you're under authority, rule number one, be respectful. Rule number one is be respectful. Verse five, slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart just as you would obey Christ. He addresses slaves because there's an estimated 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire during this time. One historian says it was probably 50% of the whole population. 50% of the population were servants or slaves. And so it's a huge percentage. So he's just straight up saying, obey your earthly masters with respect and with fear. Be respectful. Christ is the model of that. He respected everybody. He feared no one, but he respected everybody. Because when that is working for us, our conduct, if you're the guy in authority and you're taking your orders from a chain of command or somewhere else, you can navigate that a lot easier with respect if you see it, as he said, as if you were obeying Christ. We saw that two weeks ago with the role of the wife, right? When that, when that word submit comes up. Submit, why? Because it's like you're submitting to Christ. There's freedom of surrender in Christ, and so there's freedom to respect your husband in that way. And husbands have to do the same thing, because if you read earlier in Ephesians 5, I'm not going to do that sermon all over again, but some of you will remember that. So this applies especially at work, y'all. I'm not saying you're going to agree with everything that comes from uh, uh, over your head. I sure didn't. And there's always a tendency that whatever seat you're in, you envy somebody else's seat. Does that make sense? It happens in churches all the time. I know we're a volunteer organization. But I hear people say, I'm just a volunteer here. I'm not on staff, so I, I can't, you know, I, there's so much I can't do. And then I'll, I'll hear people say, well, I'm, a, I'm, I'm just a Sunday school teacher here. If I was a deacon, I'd have a little more authority to do that. And guess what the deacons are saying? I, can't, I don't have any authority around here because I'm not the pastor. The pastor gets to make those decisions. And guess what I'm saying a lot of days? I just work here. If I was a Sunday school teacher, I would be able to do, I would be able to do that maybe. So that's a never-ending wheel. It doesn't get us anywhere. Respect the person, the people over you. Uh, and, and my advice there is, in the workforce especially, if there's something that absolutely you're just butting heads with, but that's the authority figure over you, and it's not Im illegally moral or totally uncomfortable, and you know, you know you're going to have to do it, L rather than to butt heads and let it get so heated, go take a walk. Just take a walk. I can't tell you how many times I uh, walked around the plant or walked around the block of the office I was in, uh, of just like, okay, <sighs> there's a good chance it ain't going to be respectful when I go back in there. And so I, and it's for me, it's for me to, to correct my attitude because there's only limited influence you have on other people. Number two, be responsible. That's in verse six. Be responsible. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, 
doing the will of God in your heart. He compares this role of slavery to Christ three times. Do it like to Christ, do it of Christ, do it with as if you're doing it to Christ. But see what he says, do a good job, not just when they're standing over you, but when he's out of town. Why? Because that is the evidence that you are serving Christ through your role as a subordinate. Whether you are a son of a father and you're 12 and you're living in the home or whether you're a vice president of a Fortune 500 and the CEO's out of town for a week and, you know, it it applies to all levels. Be responsible. That, y'all, is an attitude thing because everybody, I think, has the capacity to perform to the level they're supposed to do that. So can I dial it? back to recent current events here no matter whether you agree or disagree with the elections or your guy won or didn't win watch what you put on the social media can I say that again watch what you put on the social media because you are a Christ follower who is dialing in on social media secondarily with your opinion so what we put out there is there for whoever happens to see it, and that is a reflection of how responsible I am and you are as a Christ follower, not a citizen, a Christ follower. So we got to watch it. Third thing, be committed. Yeah, be committed. Verse uh, 7, serve wholeheartedly. That's commis- commitment. As if you were, guess who? As if you were serving the Lord, there's the third time, not men. Uh, Colossians 3.23 says that. Whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord and not as unto men. Whether it's sweeping a floor, whether it's cutting, mowing your grass in the back where nobody's going to see it, whether it's painting a fence that your eyes are probably the only ones going to see it, right on up to preparing a $14 billion budget for some organization, all of those, all of those areas. We do it as unto the Lord and not unto men. Peter said it in a different context in Acts 5, 29. He gets hauled into court. He's in trouble. He's been preaching in the streets, and they don't like it, and he's starting to be persecuted. And he says, here, here's, here's my role, you know. Uh, I'm here because of your authority, but I'm here also to please God and not please men. And so we still go back to that with our our commitment level. Why is it important, necessary to be committed? Well, look at verse 8. Because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. We participated yesterday in a, a memorial service for one of our members here who's now with Jesus. And it was so good to be able to remind ourselves and, and remind the family and the audience that, you know, uh, everything Jerry did of sacrifice for you, for the Lord, for his job, as he did it with the attitude of a Christ follower, that now is being noted and lined out in heaven, and he's being rewarded for that somehow. Now, that's not supposed to be our motivation for doing it, but that is a byproduct of the freedom of surrender. When you give truly give Christ your life, you're committing your ways to him. Now, a lot of people think they're committed, but they're just contributing a little bit here and there when it's, when it's convenient or not too costly. It's like thing, you probably heard it. I heard it a long time ago, too. Uh, a pig and a chicken were walking up the road, and they walked by this church, and there's a sign that says, uh, potluck breakfast being served today. And the chicken says, I think we ought to donate something. I think we ought to contribute to that. Yeah, that's a good idea. I tell you what, I'll contribute that, the eggs and you contribute the ham to it. And the pig says, well, that, you know, yours is definitely a contribution. Mine's more of a heavy commitment, if you want to know the truth. <laughs> Don't confuse the two. Your commitment, you can, you, can, you can believe me or not, your commitment empowers you to what we call lead up. Your commitment and your respectfulness and your responsibility that you're taking, other people are watching. 
whether they're on your level in the org chart or whether they're underneath you, or but especially if they're over you. And you are influencing them. You are leveraging your influence as a subordinate to lead the leaders. It happens every single day. I am proud to say that the other team, the other guys on this team in the church that you've brought in to serve this community, they influence me in a significant way every single week. And it ought to be that way. I, I, see, uh, I see educators in, in schools, in public schools, leading up all the time. The assistant principals, the principals, other administrators, or what have you, are, are significantly influenced by that elementary, that high school grade teacher who doesn't have any real authority over him or her. But nevertheless, their life and their works shows this. You even leverage it when there's stuff you cannot control, like your health, like COVID situations. We all have had a good lesson for the last eight months, haven't we? On, well, can't do this anymore, can't do that anymore. You know, it's sad when James has to stand up in here and say, just wave at everybody, but it's the way it is. And we know it's the way it is. By the way, guest, if you'd come in here this time last year, you'd already been jumped and hugged on about three times. And I hate that, that we can't do that back yet. But we know how, we know that's the way it works. But leading up and leveraging up and your authority says, but what can we do? But what can we do in the light of the things we cannot do? And what he's telling even slaves, hey, you're locked up, you're in slavery, first century. So there's a lot of things that are not, in your, uh, not on your radar. They can't be, you can't do those things. But what can you do? Not too long after I moved here, Sherry and I took a, a trip downtown to Charleston, and we toured this, uh, one of these old antebellum homes, you know, the, the Manigault House. It's on Meeting Street. Some of you might have been there before, uh, from the early 1800s, I believe. And it's a beautiful place, and they tour you around in there, of course. And the furniture is unbelievable. Now, you know, I, I, am, not, I am not a knowledgeable person of exquisite furniture. I mean, it can be the most exquisite European imported furniture in the world, and I don't know it from a rooms to go cabinet, okay? I just, they all look good to me. But we walked up to one in this bedroom and the guy made it a point to take the, our little group over to the corner, there was this cabinet. And I, ha I still have the picture in my cell phone and I didn't take time to put it where y'all could see it. But anyway, oh, it is unbelievable. It is unbelievable, beautiful. Cabinet and mirror and all that stuff. And, and it was one of a hundred pieces, though, but he said, you know, this one's a little bit special because um, it, it almost got th uh, thrown out or sold, but when the owners changed here and they were fixing it up and renovating it, they started going through it really closely with, um, you, you know, gl with glasses and, and seeing if they could find anything about a date and all. They didn't find a date, but they found a name inscribed in the wood on the very back of it, and they traced it back and it was a slave of that household who made that piece of furniture. And I got to researching. During that era, there were like 3,300 fine, exquisite cabinet makers just in the low country, 3,300. Guess what? 25% of them were slaves. But they were working with such craft and such care and such skill that some of them actually earned their emancipation and went into business and became as wealthy as their owners. But even those who did not, and I hadn't been able to trace this fella by his, just his one first name, whether he was in that, that league or not, but whether or not they did, that's not the point. The point was they did what they could do as unto the Lord. And we're still talking about it in, in this century and still admiring that piece of furniture. And there's, there's thousands of examples like that. So is slavery condoned in the scriptures? 
He's addressing slaves. He does the same thing in Colossians. We see it in other of his letters. We see it in the Old Testament. Unfortunately, slavery has been around in every civilization. We find it in the very first book of the Bible. It's been around since at least 4,000 B.C. It's, um, it's not condoned, but it was a fact of life. Let's go to the first century. Roman Empire not only permitted it, it made it legal. Put the father, as I said last week, the father was at the center of the authority figure of all of that. The father could lead his family however he wanted to. He could lead the slaves, the servants, however he wanted. Some of them were household servants. They lived with the families. They had a pretty high standard of life. Others were more like slaves. There were no laws in the early days even to dictate how harsh the discipline or the correction could be or how lenient it was, and there were some abuses. There were some terrible, awful abuses of slaves of every race, creed, and color. Some of them were the same uh, race of the owners. Some of these slaves had a higher education level. And, and were smarter than their owners, it didn't matter. The situation was thus. There was no social system. There was no, hey, you can apply here and make a living. Sometimes indentured servitude, uh, borderline slavery was the only way to survive. It appears, and I've researched this a lot because it's such a sensitive issue. It appears that m for the most part, the treatment was good and fair, and the, here's another thing, Jewish law coming out of the Old Testament said you had, to, you had to emancipate a servant every seven years. So they're there for six, seven years at the most, and then they are set free. The other reason it was permitted, there was no fallback. If you decided to emancipate those servants their living conditions usually would be much worse and much more costly than if they, if they just continued to live. And so I'll come back to that. But my answer to does it condone it, no. What it's doing is stating the fact that it is a part of this society. Now let me clear something else up too. From what I'm reading, by and large, that level of servitude that Paul is commenting on in the New Testament was not as unjust and brutal as the African slavery that was here and in other nations centuries later. It was not located and targeted at one race, it was multi-race, and also it was a little bit more humane. But it was the way of life. Aristotle even commented on this in one of his writings. Aristotle says slaves were living tools but they, had a, they were a possession, but they had a soul. They were tools with a soul, is what he called it. So let me say this, and please listen as I say this. Slavery in any situation is not right. There is never a time to justify taking the freedom away from another human being and putting him or her underneath you. So let me, I'll come back to that in a minute. So let's move on. What, what if you are the one in authority? And, so, and all of you are in some degree, at some, in some place. What if you are in authority? Number one, and this comes from verse 9, practice the golden rule. First part of verse 9. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. In the same way, like Matthew 7, 12. Do unto others as you would have them do unto, the, unto you, right? And so to make it a wider context too, guess what it says about Jesus in Philippians 2.7? In Philippians 2.7, uh, the writer says, Jesus took off his divinity long enough to put on the form of a servant because he led by serving. That's no, that's no news break for any of you, right? Jesus' leadership style that was so radical was service to whoever needed it. Paul, in almost every letter he writes, says, hey, it's me, it's Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ. Doulos in the Greek, servant or slave. The same word 
that Jesus is prescribed to have. The same word that's in here. He's equalizing the status of everybody who is under the authority of Christ. And that is what, that is what I'm trying to say by the golden rule here. Because there's a reciprocal relationship then. If the slave owner is being a good Christ follower, guess what? The slave has no real problem with that. And the slave is more able to, to respect and submit and do his best uh, while he's under the charge of, of the slave owner and all. So if you are in a situation of authority, how do you leverage your authority? Just like Jesus did. Every room Jesus walks into, he looks for a way to leverage his authority for the good of, not him, for the good of the whole room. And you know what? That's what a wise, just president ought to do. That's what a wise, just leader in any uh, area of government ought to do. That's what a good corporate leader ought to do. That's what a good non-profit, that's what a good Sunday school teacher ought to do. That's what a good pastor ought to do. You leverage what authority and power you have for the others around you. Why? Because it brings equality. Not of rank, but equality of value. Because everybody else in the room is just as important to God and to this society as you are. They're not less, but they're not, they're not more. The second thing is be just. Practice golden rule, be just. Verse 9, do not threaten them. Do not threaten them. If you have to keep people who are under you in line by threatening them, guess what? You ain't really a leader. Punishment is never motivational. It only brings fear or insecurity or resentment or anger. It reduces every relationship to a non-relationship, to a transactional situation. I'm over you and my position says that and because I'm over you, let me remind you that if you don't do this, then this will happen. There are times you have to give consequences. I understand that. But by and large, when you take that attitude, you remove the relational part of it and that's not what Jesus taught. I, am a, I choose to be of the Christian faith, in essence, one reason, because if you compare our faith, I believe, to other world religions, we have a relational God who is not content to sit up in heaven and just dictate and threaten and condemn us and zap us. There is judgment, there is a theology of judgment, but he sends his own son to bridge a relational gap for us, and the son pays the price as innocent for my fallenness, and in the end, I have this personal, any day, 24-7 relationship with God because of his son. I can't give you any better news than that. So I have no excuse for not being just in the people I'm dealing with. And, and you know this here, but we gotta remind ourselves here. The biggest motivational thing is love. Go ask a veteran who served in wartime, what made you do what you did and risk your life? Uh, it's love of country, but number one is gonna be love of my brother fighting next to me. Colossians 4, verse 1 says almost the exact same thing. Because why? Authority strengthens equality. Can I see my little doodad there? Thank you. All right. So down here at the bottom, we've got the slaves. Here we've got owners. And this can be the, the boss and the subordinate. This can be in any situation. Obviously, there's downward leadership and downward authority here. But then Christ comes along, and the first century teaching after Christ's resurrection is 
owner, slave owner, master, guess who's over you? There's a, there's a higher authority. It's Jesus Christ. So once you acknowledge that, guess what else? Those people living under your charge are on the same level with you. Because I love them just as much, and I came to redeem them just as much. And so here's what leading up is all about. Bang. That servant has the ability to influence to the top of the, to influence the male-dominated father figure in that whole house. And it happened many, many times. We have documented. So the last thing is promote equality. Jesus taught we're all brothers and we're all sisters. A slave of Jesus also transforms into a son or a daughter of God through Jesus. And that's the rest of that story. The kingdom, on, the kingdom of heaven, I'm told and I read, is a perfect place, right? And we all look forward to that, to that one day. But we're also taught by Jesus that he came so the kingdom would, of heaven would come to earth. How's that going to happen? It's got to be from inside me. And it's got to be from inside you. Now, it's not going to be perfect. But that's my job, whether I'm on top of the authority scale or on the bottom or in the middle of the authority scale. I've got to treat everybody with the same dignity and love and respect. Why doesn't, why doesn't Scripture condemn slavery? I think there's three or four reasons from what I've been able to trace back historically. One is, remember, first century Christians had no status. They were being hunted and, and jailed by like 70 A.D. or, or earlier. So it wasn't like they could just go out and get a voting block together. They weren't voting anyway. They're under Roman rule, right? So it wasn't like they had a, a real choice there. But the other thing is there was a trend already starting where more and more slaves were being emancipated as the right thing to do. One estimate, one historian said uh, between like 70 B.C., and 12 BC, there were 50, there were half a million slaves emancipated alone. And so by the time they're into the mid first century, it is much more the trend than even that was. The other reason was there were starting to be some laws in the first century by the Romans to enact some recourse for the overtaxing, the cruel and abusive owners who were punishing their slaves unduly. They were being cracked down on. Plus, like I said, the emancipation cycle was already into effect. So the trend was already moving that way, plus there was no power on the other end. So um, that's why I think it's not condemned, is there was nothing to replace it at that point except... Let's, let's continue to move society-wise to where we can make it where they're self-sustainable when we do emancipate them. And there's so many recorded histories where the relationship was so good that a Roman owner or some other owner would end up adopting the kids or keeping, even after emancipation, the family, the, the, the slaves would decide, no, I think life is better here. And there were quasi or legal adoptions that would happen. And so again, slavery is never right. I'm not just finding it. I'm trying to answer historically what the Bible is silent on. Does the Bible condemn it? Not as we'd label condemn, but did it condone it? No. And it does not condemn it if you look at the sweep of Scripture as a whole. Because the human rights element is clear from cover to cover that we are all equal under God. So there's a bottom line I'm going to give you today. The kingdom system is one of kinship. If authority strengthens equality, if that's the model Jesus taught us and that's the model I'm charged with and you're charged with, whether I'm under or over 
a, a person of authority, I got to understand the kingdom system has to define my leadership or my role or my status or my lack of status. And that is of kinship. That's where I said a slave becomes a son or a daughter. And y'all, that is the most liberating life to live. The decades I've had, once I finally figured that out, I just got to tell you, I have never felt so free and so empowered and so uh, fulfilled to live on this earth. Not because of me, but because of the authority of the one that I gave my life to. I'm still working on it, though. Please don't hear me say I've got it figured out because I still have days I need to take a walk. And I still have days that I'm asking, if not out loud, I'm asking in here, you're not the boss of me. And I don't need to do what that says. And I don't recognize that authority. But it's still not my job. Because the authority. Philemon 15, 16. If, we're doing, if you're ever doing a Bible drill and you, and you want to win and you're getting to call out your opponents, ask them to find Philemon. Because there, there's, there's only like 25 verses. And so that's why God puts a table of contents in your Bibles. And I know if you got the, the, the app, you're just scrolling down. But Philemon, I'm going to read two verses. Philemon... Um, 15 and 16, Paul is writing this again too, and it is a letter to a slave owner about a former slave. And he says this, perhaps the reason he, the slave, was separated from you, why was he separated? He ran off. <laughs> the slave ran away. His name was Onesimus for a little while, was that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave. As a dear brother, he is very dear to me, but even dearer to you both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. See what he's doing? He's campaigning for this runaway slave who has come to know Jesus Christ. Now, what he doesn't say in here, but what we know is Paul was a prisoner in a Roman prison. Somehow Onesimus comes through there, and Onesimus comes like a personal assistant to Paul, some people think that he was dictating what we've been reading, the book of Ephesians, as Paul was telling him what to write. We don't know that for sure. There's also a legend, may be true, may not be true. We do know historically the second bishop of the church of Ephesus, late first century, was a man by the name of Onesimus. We know that this guy went back to Ephesus to resume being a servant for a while longer to the slave owner. It could be that that bishop one day was elevated 20 years later to a very powerful place of authority, was a former slave. But either way, Paul says, you know what? You're getting more than a slave back, you're getting a brother. You're getting a brother. So under God's authority, it's your job to love him like a brother. And that's my job, and that's your job, is to love whoever God puts in front of me like a brother or like a sister. And so that's why we're here, is to hopefully learn how to do that. So out there, um, I'm about to pray. I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to pray for the people in our room. Eddie's going to come on up and uh, lead us in one more song. But before we do that, um, I just want to pray that we gather our thoughts and our attitudes and our minds to go out to be the greatest leveraging agents of authority that we've ever been. So would y'all stand and let me pray for you. Father, um, the, the task is not going to happen if I'm in the way of my personal life. If I'm in charge of my personal life, I got no shot. But by the power of the Holy Spirit and the conviction of the Scripture, I have a shot at living as a slave of Jesus Christ, which so liberates me and so empowers me 
that I can leverage what authority you've given me into the lives of whoever else I'm in contact with, beginning in my own home. And so, God, those that are struggling, there's situations out of their control, and they feel helpless and hopeless. Tell them that hope is not only not lost, there's this hope of glory that says, give it over to me. There are so many things you can do, and there's so many things you can still be. So leverage it to my uh, direction. There are others of us that are struggling with places of authority, and we don't want to get it wrong, and we don't want to be abusive, and we don't want to be, um, we don't want to be that kind of person. And so God, give us true wisdom to worry, to, to be more concerned about equality and justice than we are our positions. And we give this to you for, in Christ's name, amen.